Hey, what's up everybody? Let's Talk Jets Radio. Kevin Serkin here. Hopefully you guys still recognize my face. It's been, I don't know how many weeks since I've done a video. Um, you know, part lazy, part just, you know, a lot of stuff going on work-wise, personal life-wise. So it just felt good to, you know, kind of get away from it for a little bit. Um, you know, not think so much about football or doing videos or, you know, going on Twitter and, you know, putting takes out there, arguing with Jeff fans. Um, and, you know, it just felt good to kind of get away from it for a few weeks uh, while still doing the podcast and everything else. But, it uh, feels even better now as I'm starting to get back in the swing of things and just getting ready for the off season and plenty of storylines to follow. And, you know, I was excited to do this video today. And un unfortunately, um, you know, about a half hour ago, I heard the news with uh, Kobe Bryant and it, incredibly tragic. And it's just a, another reminder. And it's a shame that this, you know, it always happens when it's a, a high profile celebrity, you know, that loses their life, you know, at, at a young age, um, you know, or somebody that's more well known. But, you know, the unfortunate sad reality is that you know these types of things do happen you know frequently there was the ESPN reporter uh, Carly McCord um, who was the daughter of the LSU passing game coordinator I believe and you know she passed away just a few weeks ago before the bowl game you know in a helicopter and it's like Jesus you know you know it's just a reminder life is short you know do the things you love don't take it for granted tell the people that you love them that you love them because you never know when it's going to end you know you never know what tomorrow's going to bring and you know, life is just crazy sometimes. So that's part of the reason why, uh, you know, Tyson and I we wanted to start the Let's Talk Mental Health channel in addition to, you know, still staying on uh, with Let's Talk Jets because, you know, we realize that sports is that escape outlet for so many people and, you know, talking sports is a great escape and it's what we love to do. But every now and then, you know, life throws you a curveball and, you know, you need somebody to, you know, talk through those those feelings with. So um, obviously that's why we're here to, you know, talk sports, but also you need to reach out about life. You know, we're here for that too. So, you know, getting back to Jets really quick, obviously on a little bit of a somber note. Um, first off, shout out to all the callers on Tuesday night. That show was, um, you know, one of the better shows that we've had in the off season. Just a lot of good calls, a lot of good takes on the off season, a lot of informative takes, which, you know, was nice to see, um, you know, people that actually took the time to, you know, come up with a plan, have some players in mind. Um, the, the concern for me, I think is the same concern for a lot of people that we don't know the kind of role that Adam Gase is going to have this off season, what kind of say he's going to have, how much power and how much control he has. Um, you know, Joe Douglas, he has the longer contract, a six year deal. He is the general manager. That is a position of more authority, but you know, Adam Gase is also the one who brought him in here. Um, what's the dynamic going to be like? They both, you know, report separately to ownership. So if there is a disagreement on a player, you know, if Joe Douglas wants to bring in somebody, but Adam Gase says, no, that guy doesn't fit my system, you know, who gets the final say? You know, I, I think that's going to be an interesting dynamic to see, watch out, um, or to watch play out. Um, and then, you know, you look at some players and I, I keep hearing a lot of the same names, whether it's, uh, Brandon Scherf, um, Jack Conklin, uh, the guard Thune, uh, a lot of the same names keep kind of coming up and, you know, I think it's imperative, obviously, if, if there's one thing that Douglas and Gase hopefully can agree on, it's that offensive line should be priority number one. I'd be shocked if they don't have that agreement. Adam Gase needs it for his offense to work. Joe Douglas, he believes in the trenches and the D-line wasn't terrible. They were one of the better run defenses in football, still need a pass rush. But I think that the trenches, especially on the offensive side of the ball, that has to be priority number one. I don't know anybody who would disagree with that. So I think the Jets and Douglas need to be willing to overpay for some of those top tier guys on the O-line. I just don't know if they're going to be able to get them to come to New York, whether it's to play for Adam Gase or just not believing the Jets are close enough to being a winner yet. You better be willing to overpay to get those guys here because you're not going to get them, you know, with this being an attractive destination or a team that's ready to win now or, you know, a coach that they want to come play for. Like, we don't have those things to sell anybody, unfortunately. That's just reality. We do not have those things right now. Um, so there is going to be a tax if you want to get a guy to, to come here. And there are a lot of teams that have needs on the O-line, a lot of teams that have needs for a pass rusher right now. So I'm a little bit concerned heading into free agency. I think the Jets are going to have to, you know, really hone in on the draft to fill a lot of their needs. Um, you know, with some of their own free agents, I think that Robbie Anderson, unfortunately, is probably going to be priced out. Um, he's definitely a solid number two, worthy of, you know, maybe that nine, ten, eleven million dollar range. But I think he's going to be seeking number one wideout money and you know, with all the teams that have cap space out there, I'm sure he's going to get it from somebody, um, whether it's Miami Dolphins and he, you know, he returns back home to Florida or he goes somewhere else. I think Robbie's probably going to get the money he's looking for somewhere else and it won't be from the Jets. And that can be okay because this is a loaded draft at wide receiver. I know some people disagree about making that the priority in the draft, but that's why it's so important to hit on those free agent offensive linemen because then at pick 11, 
you do have the option of going with the Jerry Judy or a C.D. Lamb or a Henry Ruggs or somebody that you believe can be a number one and grow and develop with Sam because I think that is so important. Yes, you need to protect him and you need to give him an opportunity, you know, back there to, to make some plays. But getting him a true number one that he can grow with for the next 10 to 15 years, I, I think that's just as important. And, you know, the fact that you have four uh, picks within the early portion of the top three rounds, um, that gives you that luxury to get a receiver early. And you could still take a couple of off offensive linemen within, you know, round two or with your three set or third round picks. So, you know, they have some options as far as how they can approach this. But landing free agent offensive linemen is going to be the biggest thing. If they could do that, I think that makes you know, uh, a trickle down effect that allows them to, you know, really focus in at wide receiver or edge rusher or cornerback, the skill positions in the draft, which are obviously incredibly important, but also, you know, some, some mid round offensive linemen too. Um, a few other stories, Jamal Adams, you know, he's playing in the pro bowl right now. I'm about to head in and check that out. Um, I'm hoping that the jets are going to throw the bag at him, but you know, just like with the offensive linemen, there's going to be attacks, right? You know, whether or not you're actually, you know, shopping him or not, he believes that he felt betrayed. Um, I don't think he's deleted that tweet yet, you know, calling out Douglas and Gase. So you're going to have to pay a tax for shopping him and you're going to have to pay a tax for, you know, three straight losing seasons of football that you know he has visibly been frustrated about. Um, you see it all over his face. You saw it at the end of 2018 and then much throughout 2019. He is fed up with losing. Um, that's not the kind of player he is. It's not the kind of environment that he wants to be in. And I think he would absolutely welcome a trade. We saw it at the deadline. He was ready to go to Dallas. All the rumors, you know, said if they were willing to give him a contract extension, you know, he would probably go there. So, um, you know, if the Jets can get that first round pick and the two second round picks, which I believe was the asking price at the trade deadline, it's hard to imagine Joe Douglas not pulling the trigger because, and again, I think this also, again, goes back to the offensive lineman debate. If you don't get the offensive lineman and suddenly now it's a longer rebuild, right? All right, maybe we're going to have to make drafting all linemen the priority. Those guys usually take a little bit longer to develop. They're not usually stud all linemen in that first year. Um, it, it delays the process a little bit to the point where I think maybe you start saying, well, you know what? This is our best chip. If he can get us a first and two twos, think of how we could build around Sam that way. Not that I want to do that. I think Jamal is a great leader. He's the face of your defense along with CJ Mosley. Um, you know, he's a guy that I think you just got to give the bag to and, and let him do his thing and know that he's not going to change once he gets the money. He's going to be the, the same player that he was before his contract. You know, so I think he's just a guy that's set on being great, set on, you know, making a Hall of Fame path. And hopefully that's with the Jets. So uh, another guy that we thought was on the Hall of Fame path, Le'Veon Bell, I think that situation, unfortunately, is going to unfold a lot differently. I think it's pretty clear that the Jets want to move on from him. Um, if there was a team that was willing to just take on his contract at the deadline, the Jets were okay with taking back, I think it was a third or a fourth round pick, any kind of mid-round pick, just to unload the contract, which is insane that this is where we're at after decades of not having a dynamic offensive playmaker. We get one that falls on our lap in free agency. Yeah, we have to overpay for him for a little bit, but a guy that could do it all, and suddenly Adam Gase just can't get any production out of him. Blame the offensive line all you want. Blame, you know, Sam getting mono. Blame whatever you want. Adam Gase has got to give him opportunities with the ball in space, put him in the right position to succeed. You know, his play calling was trash. There are so many reasons you can point to for why Le'Veon Bell was not productive with the Jets. And Adam Gase didn't want him in the first place. And he doesn't believe in using running backs. And so when you look at the price tag, $14.5 million, why are they going to keep him this year? What reason do they have? I think he, he only had a couple touchdowns last year. I don't even think he cracked a thousand yards. So just based on the production, based on how Adam Gase used him um, and how he believes in running backs in his offense, I, I just don't see this being a fit. And, you know, I don't know if you're going to find anybody that takes on his contract. And I think that could be even worse if you have a disgruntled Le'Veon Bell, um, you know, coming back next year and he has a voice in the locker room. Players respect him. And I think that just doesn't bode well for Adam Gase. So. Um, the, the last, actually not the last thing, there's a few things I wanted to talk about. I'm kind of rambling now, but, um, obviously the Jets have some of their own free agents that they got to address. Um, you know, in, in addition to Robbie, you got Jordan Jenkins, who's a guy I would love to see them resign. Um, I think he's looking at probably about eight to 10 million per year over three to four years. I think he's definitely worth it every year. He's improved since he's been in the league. Um, just a quiet lunch pail guy. He's stepped up a little bit more as a vocal leader in the last few years. Um, still not that dominant edge guy. But I think opposite that dominant edge guy, he is a good starter to have at outside linebacker. So I'd like to see him back. Um, a few other guys that I think uh, might not be back, um, guys that have some 
Um, pretty big paydays coming up that aren't guaranteed. Brian Winters, Daryl Roberts. Um, there's somebody else I'm forgetting. Who is it? Um, Brian Winters, Daryl Roberts, and there's one more position that's making decent money that is not guaranteed that the Jets are probably going to part ways with. Why am I drawing a blank on this one? Avery Williamson, thank you. So between those three guys, they could save about $20 million, um, which would get them up to about $75 million, which um, if you are thinking about extending Jamal Adams or making a play for a big free agent offensive lineman or two, that's going to wipe out a good portion of your cap space. So for everyone out there that's thinking, you know, we're going to sign two O-linemen, we're going to extend Jamal, and we're going to sign player A, B, C, and D, you know, we're going to sign Robbie and, and Jenkins, all those things aren't going to happen. They, they, they have some cap space, but not that much. So... Um, there's going to have to be some some important decisions that they have to make. Even some under the radar guys, you know, with Neville Hewitt, uh, James Burgess. I could see Kelvin Beecham possibly coming back at right tackle. I could see Alex Lewis coming back for depth. I could see Brandon Shell coming back for depth. None of those guys should be starters other than Beecham. But I think if you want to bring both of those guys back who did get to start a good number of games this year, who have some chemistry with some of the guys that are going to be back, um, that know Adam Gase's system and the verbiage. I think it's worth it to bring those guys back for depth, maybe even a Tom Compton as well. So um, with that, the last thing I wanted to get into is Sam Darnold. And this conversation just fascinates me because it seems like fans either love him or hate him, you know, which is crazy after two years, considering he's only 22 years old. But, you know, we already see a lot of the talk about him being a bust, you know, that in his second year, he didn't come close to doing the things that Lamar Jackson did, that Pat Mahomes did, that Deshaun Watson did. And I agree, he didn't take that leap that I think a lot of people expected him to take. But I still have 100% uh, confidence that he has the ability to do those things. I think we saw it in moments, we saw it in flashes, and there were plenty of reasons why it didn't happen consistently, whether you want to blame the mono, whether you want to blame the offensive line, whether you want to blame Adam Gase. Facts are facts. The Jets' offense was one of the worst offenses in football this year. In almost every single meaningful statistical category, they finished 30th, 31st, or 32nd. You know, third down conversions, points per game, um, I think passing yards per game, rushing yards per game. I mean, there was nothing that they did well. And Adam Gase was supposed to be the guy that engineered everything to get more out of the players that were here, be the offensive guru, you know, have Sam take that next step, and it just didn't happen, Okay. For whatever reason, it didn't happen. So, obviously, there's plenty of reasons to point to why it might not have happened, but in year three, the pressure's on. Don't give me any excuses. Don't allow Adam Gase to have any excuses, which is why the O-line has to be the priority, and I would even make wide receiver the priority um, in the draft. So, if you give Sam weapons and you give him the blocking that he needs, what excuses could Adam Gase possibly have for not producing points next year with his offense? So... I'm still the biggest believer out there in Sam. I think he's going to be the franchise quarterback of this team for a very long time. And I think we're also seeing with Ryan Tannehill that, you know, even if Sam is corrupt, you know, with Gase for a year or two years or, you know, even if it's three years, whatever it might be, um, he's a good enough quarterback that I think he's going to be able to respond afterwards and, you know, still be great. Unfortunately, until that time, I think Sam's going to have to work extra hard to overcome the mistakes and the bad play calling and things like that, that Adam Gase, unfortunately, puts out there. And so hopefully Darnold has a lot of, um, you know, say at the line of scrimmage. He has the ability to make audibles and, you know, kind of call his own thing like Peyton Manning did. That way, you know, as he starts becoming more comfortable in the offense and he starts reading defenses a little bit better, he'll be able to make those calls on his own and it won't be so much about Adam Gase. So we'll see what happens. Sorry this video, uh, you know, kind of turned into a little bit of a rant. Rest in peace, Mamba, and talk to you guys soon.